Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here this morning. announcements uh, to, to remind us of uh, and again this is for our benefit as well as for any others that uh, have opportunity to see what we're recording uh, we do have our Bible study each Sunday morning at 930 encourage everyone to, to make an effort to be to that we have very good studies available for everyone uh, all ages and of course 1030 our, our worship assembly in uh, uh, Wednesday night we have Bible study at 7 o'clock. Uh, again, encourage uh, everyone to participate in that. As a reminder also, we do record everything uh, that we're doing here. This is all being recorded, and so uh, and that's, it looks just like this, so you can find it. And uh, it's, you should be able to read the uh, subject and the dates as well if you're looking for something in particular. But also, uh, we do have access on our website so that uh, and the URL for the website is on your bulletin as well so you can find that and find the information on how to get to, to where we are. There's, there's other links on there as well but uh, this will get you to, to where the recording is and you, and you can share that with other people as well. And also uh, there are other resources available online. There are a lot of folks tend to be more online than not. And uh, so uh, WV mm, WVBS and uh, the Gospel Broadcasting Network, both of these are good resources, uh, not only for individual study, but to share with other people. They, bo both of these have their own apps, and they also, uh, of course, have uh, links on the, on the internet. So lots of good resources for study and for uh, sharing with other people. Also a reminder, this is the last Sunday of the month, so next Sunday be, will be the first Sunday of June already. And uh, so I want to encourage everyone to be able to stay for our dinner together. We'll have singing following that. So uh, look forward to that as well. And as always, as a reminder of the great privilege that we have as God's children, we can talk to Him and uh, express to Him our concerns through prayer. Truly a great privilege. And we have much to, to pray about. We certainly want to remind uh, ourselves to pray for our leaders, all of those who are in leadership and authority. Uh, doesn't matter what your opinion of them may be, they need our prayers and they need God's help. Uh, also, you know that there are uh, many Christians, uh, especially in foreign countries like Ukraine, uh, Afghanistan and India, Kenya, other places where we have brethren who are striving to spread the good news and to <coughs> remain faithful to the Lord, uh, suffering some severe persecution. And I know that uh, if you've been uh, paying attention in uh, Gary Jones's emails, his letters, <coughs> the uh, India is having elections and uh, very much concerned about who might uh, win those elections been a difficult time for Christians in India, and it could get worse, so we'll continue to pray for all of our brethren in these areas, and of course those that we have from time to time been supporting in uh, Costa Rica, India, India as well, so we want to remember to pray for all these, and we've had, we have some among us who have requested uh, prayers for themselves and for others individuals that they may be aware of, maybe family members. There's some information in your bulletin as well, but we do uh, want to remember these uh, that have been uh, struggling with health issues and uh, have some challenges in their lives. Uh, and uh, so that we want to continue to remember uh, to pray for all of these uh, as well. At this time, we're going to take a couple of moments to, to pray. Pray for these that are listed here. Any other circumstances that you are aware of, uh, people, situations, uh, and uh, it, it's a it's a great blessing. That, uh, so take a couple of moments and we'll pray together. And then uh, Roy is going to lead us in our prayer following that. Let's pray together.
name in all the earth. We are so privileged to come before your presence with praise and thanksgiving for all the good things that you do for us and for our country and for those that we support all over the world. We pray for the word of God that will fall into honest and receptive hearts and bring forth much fruit. Father, to thy name's honor and glory. So that wherever in this world, the world, can, the gospel can be preached and the people being saved by those things and by their religious terms as we turn ourselves to that which is which revealed to us in his word. We ask thee, Father, to watch over and to care for us today, care for each family that's here. We pray a special blessing upon each one of them. We pray again for the word that it will spread to the honest and hearts and that there will be obedient people all over this world. Watch over us, Father, care for us, take good care of the congregation here. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <laughs> Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let us as God's children always strive to walk in the light as we are illuminated by the love of God. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful happy moments roll. Thank you. 
In 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 1, it says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. We can see that the early Christians took an opportunity to give of their beans upon the first day of the week. So we need to do the same. We need to know that we have a purpose in life, and that purpose is to serve God. Part of that purpose is to go out and to teach uh, those around us, teach one another, and to learn those things of the gospel. We need money to help do those things. We need to be able to go out and teach others. We need to supply sometimes study aids and other things to help individuals. So as we do those things, we need to realize how important it is for us to give our means. God's always given us far more than we could ever return. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing back together, Lord, for the praise of thy name and worship you, Lord. Bless today as we give back a portion of our earnings that, that it is used to further the work of the church. And uh, let us give with a given heart, not grudgingly. And we all know if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have anything, Lord. So just bless us and be with us the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast down their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The words of these uh, next two songs uh, come from that reading as uh, we even have opportunity to honor God and to call him holy and worship. Holy, holy, holy.
Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for allowing us to be your children. We're thankful for you for the fact that you have provided for us a new birth so that we could be born into your family. We pray that as your children, at all times we will be like you or strive at all times to be like you and not to act like the world. <clears throat> We're thankful for the many children that we have in this congregation. We pray that as adults we will act properly at all times so that we might set good examples examples before them that they might live grow up to live uh, true Christian lives and to serve you and to be a, a blessing to the world so that the world might be able to see uh, the kind of person you want to be your father and we are aware of the fact that Jesus said that there would always be wars and rumors of wars and we are aware of too much um, fighting going on in the world uh, we're aware of the fact that there is so much violence and even in our own nation that there is a lot of violence and there are a lot of people who are ready for violence and we know that violence is not a part of your nature and that we are not to be a part of that we are thankful for the fact that Jesus provided a way of escape from the world so that we might be your children and that we might uh, try as best we can to be good examples before the world so that they will be able to see that we are not the same, that we are different. Help us this morning as we continue in our singing, as we continue in our worship and partaking of the, the Lord's Supper. Help us to be able to concentrate <clears throat> so that we might get the most spiritual benefit from what we're doing and how we are feeling. We're thankful for uh, Jesus shedding his blood, giving his life, for us that we might have eternal life. Help us all this morning as we continue in our worship that we will serve you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. The next day he, referring to John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As we sing the, the words of this song, we're reminded of the gift that God gave us and sacrificed in his son as a lamb uh, for our sins. <clears throat>
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. As we sing the words of this song, we're reflecting on the fact that of Jesus being the Lamb of God, and also <coughs> as we examine ourselves and partaking of the Lord's Supper, which we follow, uh, we are also of the fold for which he died, and therefore we too are lambs for God. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty side and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the In Acts 20, verse 7, it says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. We can hope Gary won't last till midnight. But what we should do is realize that life has a meaning to it. And that meaning is for us to serve God. That's the single most important meaning they can be. That means that we recognize on the cross that he sent his son to die for us so that we could have salvation. And there's nothing more important than that. There's nothing more important than realizing what the cross is. In 1 Corinthians 11, we can see that we are to remember that. We are to know about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We are to know that God has never, ever forgotten any of us. And he never will. He's pre prepared a way for us to make it to heaven, even though we are sinful. 
We were sinful in what we did. He gave His Son so that we can live, so that we can make it to heaven. That's the single most important thing there is about life. So let us remember the cross means so much to each and every one of us, but it also means so much to the world. It's very important for us to know these things. There's many in this world that don't know Christ, and it's up to us to teach them. We may have never known Christ if someone didn't teach us. That cross can teach us so much if we pay attention to the cross. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let this bread that represents your son's body that was beaten and put on that cruel cross for the mission of our sins, let those take this bread and do it in pleasure of mine and thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In your prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you for this through the vine that represents your Son's blood that was shed on the cross in the midst of our sins. And bless you we take it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
think about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, we're reminded of the fact that, that he lived in the flesh even as we do, as the writer to the Hebrews reminds us, therefore the children share in flesh and blood, and he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. <laughs> but because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. As we have been uh, honoring our Savior for all of the things that he's done for us and the life that we uh, enjoy through the blessings that he has shown us and given to us freely, uh, we honor him. As we sing the words of this song, we're reminded that he is ever before the throne of God uh, in uh, being a, an advocate on our behalf. If it's convenient for you, would you stand with me while we sing together? Good to see everybody here and uh, glad we have an opportunity to be able to, to come together and, and study God's Word. We're going to look at uh, a particular word today in God's Word and to be able to get started on that, if you would, please turn to 1 John chapter 1 <clears throat> or you can uh, turn turn your eyes up here, but I, I like the uh, the rustling of pages and the, the shushing of uh, fingers as uh, they, they go across the pages. But uh, we'll go ahead and start there in, in verse number 7 of 1 John chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then, of course, uh, starting there with chapter 2, verse number 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so, again, of course, uh, you know, when, when John was writing this, uh, it, it was hard for him to add in all the verse numbers and chapters and things. Okay, actually, this was just a letter uh, that, uh, when, to make it easier for us to be able to find the place in there, the, uh, the verse numbers and, and chapters were all added in there. But this letter had a, a purpose. Uh, he was writing to Christians, and so, of course, uh, you know, because it's in the scriptures, he was, also, he was writing to us. This was something that, was, that we were going to be able to see. But the immediate audience there, again, were, were Christians, and, well, there's a reminder here. Hey, listen, uh, sin's a problem. And so, again, just looking at those that would say that, um, well, once you're saved, once you become a Christian, then you don't have to worry about anything because it's all good. God's going to take care of everything. Why would he waste his time writing to Christians saying, hey, sin's a problem? And, and again, a problem for you, a problem for us if we didn't have to worry anything about that. So again, it's something that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to. And his instructions, again, verse number seven, well, you put that little word in there. If. Sounds like there's uh, you know, something we need to, to, to think about. And, and there, there could be uh, something good, could be something bad. Let's look at the something good. If we walk in the light. Of course, you know, Christ being the light. <laughs> If we are in him, then, uh, of course, we get some good things out of it. We have fellowship with one another. Uh, and, of course, that sin problem that I'm talking about here, that is going to be taken care of because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And there's another little word that is really, really important there, A-L-L. -L. Yes, even that one. Yes, even the one that, that uh, if, he, if, if anybody only knew how bad this was, that, and, and if, if God only knew how bad this sin was, then, then I know he can't cleanse it. No, no, it, he didn't stutter or, you know, slip of the, uh, the, the, the plume as he was uh, writing this. All sin can be cleansed, even ours. But again, this reminder of even though we're Christians, this is something we have to keep in mind. If we, if we say there's no sin, if we say we don't have any sin, if we say, well, I don't have to worry about temptation anymore, I don't have to worry about sin, and, and that, of course, is, is one thing that, especially new Christians, <laughs> that we have to, to be constantly looking forward to make sure they understand this is still a problem because, again, John's writing to Christians some had been Christians for a little while. And we uh, study with somebody, we, they learn, and so this is what Jesus has done for us. They, they obey the gospel, they come out of the water. Okay, listen, I'm, I'm a Christian now. I've had my sins forgiven. This is going to be so great because I love God, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that I stay there. And so no temptation can, can get to me because I, I'm, I'm a Christian now. Until that temptation comes up and sin happens. John said, sin is something we constantly have to make sure that we are focused on to stay away from. And we know sin is bad. That's why we became Christians in the first place. We wanted sin taken away. We know sin is bad because as Christians we study God's word and we realize, well, that's the reason that Jesus came to the cross to die in the first place. But we still may sin. And, again, verse number 9, as Christians, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We may still sin as Christians. We can still get rid of that sin. There's that little word right in the very beginning of verse number 9, though. If. 
So we have a part to play in the forgiveness of our sins. It's that obedience to God. And in this particular case, as Christians, if we sin, we got to confess our sins. But if we do, well, he's going to forgive us. He's faithful. He's perfect. He keeps his promises. And so if we're willing to do what he says, then he is willing to do what he says as well. I'm going to forgive the sins. And so, what a great thought. In verse number 10, again, this reminder that we can't pretend we don't have sin. We can go around and, and nobody may see what's going on. Again, but again, as, as we're reading this, this is, it's John, he's just talking to us, right? Of course, uh, being inspired by God. God was using John's uh, 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 little big pen to, uh, uh, to write us a letter. Remember, Gary, if you say you haven't sinned, we're making God to be a liar. And God's word is not in you. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. We need to make sure we understand it does exist. But we also need to understand that we can get rid of it. And he wants us to be able to get rid of it. And so we go again, verse number one of chapter two, my little children. Hey, Christians. Hey, brothers and sisters. Hey, my family. I'm, I'm stopping what I'm doing here. I'm taking the time. I'm writing this letter to you so that you don't sin. Remember what God has done for you. Remember the decision that you made when you decided, I'm going to become a Christian. That idea of repentance was not just something that happened right then. Do you repent? Uh, sure, I can check that box. What next? This is a change of life. I am... Uh, Sorry that I have gone against what God said that I am supposed to do. So now, I am going to change. I am going to follow what God wants me to do. So it is a change of action. It is a change of words used. It is a change of, of things that are coming into us. Again, change of, of music, of movies, of, of friends, of, of work, of clothes, of all these different things that the world says, hey, it's okay. God says, this is the way we are supposed to be. And you said, this is what you're going to do. So my reminder, again, is don't sin. God loves you enough that he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sins. God loves you so much he is preparing a place for you. God loves you so much and wants you to come to this place that he's preparing for you, so he wants to get rid of sin. That thing that we decide to do, that thing that can keep us out of heaven. Don't sin, but if you do, we have an advocate. Jesus is on our side. We have someone that has done what it takes to get rid of sin. So we, we can't do anything on our own that we decide, I, I am so awesome, I was able to get rid of this sin all by myself. We can't do that. We can be obedient to God. We can do exactly what is asked of us to do. But the hard part, of getting rid of sin, John said that, that Jesus took care of all that. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we talked this morning in, in this class, we talked about uh, uh, definitions of words, and, and uh, somebody had to explain to Bob a, a definition of a word that he forgot a few times. And so you've probably heard this word propitiation before. And, and I know it's, yeah, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's the opposite of uh, amateur initiation. 
No, no, that's nothing to do with pros and amateurs. All right, okay. Propitiation, what does that mean? Because this is all this is leading up. Don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. But if you sin, listen, don't worry. Jesus is the propitiation of our sins. Okay, great. I don't know what that means. It sounds really good. And there are some that can read right across this whole verse again with that same attitude of, of just reading. You know, kind of like we're just reading through a story and we can kind of go through and, uh, and we can skip over words that we don't understand because that's, uh, well, that's too many syllables. I, I, don't, I don't say words that big. And just keep moving on. This is a really, really important word because in this section of scriptures, it talks about the fact that we don't need to sin. But if we do, we've got an answer to it. We need to know what that answer is. What has Jesus done for us? Because if we know that, well, that makes it easier to not sin. Because that shows his love for us and how much he wants us to be with him for all eternity. And so, again, this word is very important to Christians. This word should be really, really important to us. And so here John is throwing it out there to us that he's the propitiation. I don't, you know, he didn't write that word out because that's English. And he didn't exactly use that when he was writing. I know it's all Greek to me. But we're going to see if we can figure out what that word means and why it would be important for us to be able to know that. And uh, I, I know that uh, you know, some people have a hard time uh, writing in, in their Bibles, and I understand that if you don't do that. Uh, but if you do, uh, what a great day to take some notes on what this word means so that six months from now, when you read across that word, you can say, okay, I remember Gary talking about that. What did he say about that? But then you can go back and look at that. Or again, of course, if you've got the electronic version, uh, please take time to, to add some notes in or something so that you can go back. This is a really important word for us to know and understand. So let's look at uh, uh, Jesus being our propitiation and, and look at what we can see in the New Testament. And this word comes up a few times in the New Testament. And it's really, well, it's really a New Testament word. This is, uh, even though we, we see the same type of word used in the Old Testament, this is really, uh, again, for us as Christians, this is a, a New Testament word. We'll see in, in Romans chapter 3, verse number 21, it comes up again. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Again, here Paul is talking about, again, this is a reminder, hey, we've all done this. Well, except for that one guy. Jesus. But all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There is that term again. Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And we look at this particular word that's used... And we're going to go to the Greek, right? Because that's the uh, original language that these scriptures were written in. And so we look at uh, 1 John 2 and verse 2. That's where we saw the first version of it. And this word used in 1 John 2 and verse 2, and uh, any Greek scholars in here, just, okay, I'm going to pronounce this word for you so you know how it sounds. And I, I don't know if it's right, but it's, it'll, it'll sound really Greekish, right? Is that, all right. All uh, right. Hilosmos? Does that sound that sounds Greek, right? All right. Like feta cheese and just that's a Greek salad. That's something totally different. Alright, so but this idea of this word used first John two and verse two, again, we're going back to where we first started. It means atonement. It means appeasement. It means Jesus 
purchased us. Jesus freed us from our sin. Alright, so the same word, though, is used in Romans 3 and verse 25. Propitiation. A different Greek word is used in Romans 3 and verse 25. It's similar, but it's a place or a thing. You know, something where the appeasement happens, where the atonement happens. And so this uh, hilasterion, that's that sounds right. Okay, good, good. So that's, again, it means something similar. The place where atonement happens. And so Jesus was the place where we were atoned. Jesus was the place where God was appeased. Right? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we know what that means. The wages of sin is death. We deserve death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus purchased us. Jesus paid for our entrance into heaven with his blood. He was our propitiation. If we look again, this same word, helasterion, comes up again in Hebrews chapter 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. The Hebrew writer, of course, uh, uh, talking about this, uh, the, the tabernacle and the things that went into it and, and part of the, the furniture that was going into the tabernacle. And yet this word still comes up. For a tent was prepared, of course, the tabernacle. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and bread of the presence, it's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So where is propitiation in that? It is the term where we see in verse number 5, above it where the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat is hilasterion, which is translated propitiation. So mercy seat, propitiation, it's used uh, the same way. Again, this same word is used for the mercy seat. And so how can we get mercy seat and Jesus and propitiation how does all of that come together? I am so glad you asked, because that's the next few slides we're going to look at. All right, so let's look back in the Old Testament, because that's where the, uh, the letter of the Hebrews, this is written, written to remind them, hey, listen, this is what happened. This is what we used to have. We had the tabernacle. We had all this, this furniture in there, including the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark had the, uh, the mercy seat on it, as well as the, the things on the inside. So let's, uh, why would he flash back to the mercy seat? And then, of course, we understand the purpose of the letter of Hebrews is talking about Jesus is so much better, better than Moses, better than the law of Moses, better than angels, better than the, the, the covenant that he made with the children of Israel. Jesus is so much better. So let's go back and see what he was talking about here again in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 25. They were uh, told to make an ark and bring in the animals, uh, two by two. Okay, this is totally a different ark. Uh, this, that was uh, back in Genesis with Noah for that one. All right, so with this one, it make a box. Again, which again, when you start looking at uh, the terminology, just to say on a side note here, when God told Noah to build an ark, he was telling him, build a box. So uh, lovely ship pictures that Google has for us to look at, but most likely... Make a box, and, and it's going to float for you. But that's just totally totally to the side there. Now we're we'll back to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, so in Exodus chapter 25, God's instructions to Moses and then Moses to the people, oh, we're going we're gonna to build a box for God, and we're going we're gonna to cover it all with gold, and it's going to be uh, nice and fancy. We're going to put some things inside of there. But that's not where the instructions stopped. He was, again, very specific about how to make it, how, how big to make it. Put the rings on there so you can run the, uh, the, the poles through there. So 
Us that doesn't die. That'll, that'll come up later. But verse number 17 of Exodus chapter uh, 25 starts off again. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you uh, about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. And so we look at, again, normally you start looking at the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and of course you know, this is um, you know, some, the artist's rendering of what the Ark looked like. It probably looks something similar to this, but we don't, you know, all the, the Polaroid pictures were destroyed, uh, so we don't have pictures of the actual Ark of the Covenant. All right, but this is uh, you know, based on uh, the description given in the scriptures and, and you know, what they think it probably looked like. And so you see, again, you, you've got the wood poles there, you've got the rings and all that, the box. And then you have the description here again of, of what we look at. And again, what we have is this is the mercy seat right here. It's Make a lid for this box. And then on top of the lid, the mercy seat, I want you to also add some cherubim. Cherubs, uh, a couple of uh, you know, th have their wings uh, pointing to each other, have them looking at each other. This is where I'm going to speak to you from, and uh, way better than any Wi-Fi we could have today. Uh, no matter where that went, he was able to communicate with them. Of course, no matter where the children of Israel went, God was able to communicate. But this is again for when it's in the tabernacle and when the uh, high priest goes in to be able to have the conversation. This is where God was going to, to speak to them. But again, his instructions were, you shall make a philosterian. Again, that's the Greek. Of course, they were writing it originally in, in Hebrew, translated by the 70. And we have the Septuagint, where when they translated, this is the mercy seat that I want you to make. Make this lid. This is what they translated it to. This place for atonement. This place for appeasement, make that. This mercy seat, this lid. And so, this place where atonement happens, this place where God would speak to them, this was a really, really important place. Again, this was uh, kept behind the curtain. The high priest was the only one that's allowed to go back in there. And so we understand the idea of uh, places that we can go where something significant happened. We look at uh, today being uh, Memorial Day. Sorry, Memorial Day weekend. We got Memorial Day tomorrow. And we remember uh, the sacrifices that a lot of people made so that we could be free as well as other people could be. Some people may recognize this place more than others. It looks like, uh, well, there's no crowds at the beach. What a lovely place to go and, and play in the sand. This, of course, uh, being uh, across the, the pond. Uh, this being in France, uh, Normandy. Just a few years ago, this beach was covered with bodies of blood, massive holes. I'm sure some people can go out to these beaches and what a nice, lovely beach. It's uh, water just uh, rolling up on my feet. And there are others who go out here and have been out here to visit and, and cry. And just stand there because they know what happened here. So many people died. 
uh, the French can go there to be able to see this is where the world came to save us. They don't speak German in France now because of what happened here and of course on into the country. But here was the entry point. We go to a uh, building, hopefully you might remember this building. And uh, even before Texas was a, a state, uh, they were fighting against uh, their enemy. And all died in the building here except for maybe one so that they could tell here's what happened. And so again, some people go and, and they can walk in here and say, oh cool, a fort. In the middle of downtown and all the buildings around and it doesn't look like a place that be set up for a fort. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, you know, seeing the movie, it, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's kind of expecting nowhere. But again, there's some people that can go in there and it's a place of uh, reverence and they know exactly what happened there. That there were a lot of people that died there. And then you have this place. This uh, place where appeasement happened, where atonement happened. This was a very, very special place, this mercy seat. And so as these translators were uh, trying to describe, you know, it's all right, we're going to take uh, this, this description of the Ark of the Covenant and we're going we're to give it this name in Greek so that they understand what this means. So this is a place where atonement happened. This is the place where us as Jews, this was where God was appeased. Of course, that happening on the Day of Atonement. Every year. You see, in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, they uh, had instructions. This was a day that they would uh, move towards every year. Again, this was a, this was a day, listen, that you're going you're gonna to be fasting. You're going to be uh, uh, silent. You're going to be irreverent. You're, you're going to be thinking about things because this is the day God's going to get rid of your sin. It shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. This is a uh, federal holiday. Nobody is working. I mean, there's going to be some people working on, on Monday, on the, tomorrow. It's a federal holiday. God said in this particular case, this is going way beyond uh, Memorial Day or any other day that we might set up. Nobody needs to be working. Everybody needs to be focused on what is happening today. It's big. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make the atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall make atonement for the priest and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. A day of reflection, repentance, cleansing. God was going to get rid of sin that day. Of course, we see in uh, previous verses, verse number 6, uh, he shall make the atonement for the holy place. Again, we, as we read, the, the, the priest goes in. He is uh, making atonement for, for everything. I mean, even for the, for the tabernacle, for the tent itself. And then for, for himself, and then for uh, the other priest, and then, and then for all the people. But here we have, before he gets started, he, he is going to make a sacrifice. Atonement for his own sin. So then he can start working on all the others. Exodus verse number 16. 
I used to make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. We see back in verse number 14, here is how he does that. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with the finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Blood was used to sprinkle on the mercy seat, again, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And then, verse number 15, he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Again, blood being taken sprinkled over the Ark of the Covenant to there and over the mercy seat and that place where God said he would be where he would speak to them blood was sprinkled there an atonement for the people so that they could be free from sin because we see again uh, in verse number 16 thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel because of their transgressions all their sins so he will do with the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness this was what they were, uh, this day was really, really important to them because this is the day that, that God would, would get rid of their sin and that they could be clean. And this was every single year. These sacrifices of these animals would be made. The high priest would have to go in and, and, and sprinkle this blood on everything including the mercy seat. And so we look at now Christ being our mercy seat. Christ being our propitiation for our sins. Again, we see that in Romans 3 and verse 25. That he is called out. He is the propitiation, a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That God put him forward. This is the sacrifice that I am making for you. And again, this word that's used, hilasterion, this place or thing where appeasement happens, that's what he is calling Christ. This mercy seat, this place of appeasement, that is Christ. So that sounds like we need to make sure that we are in Christ where all these spiritual blessings are found. If we want to be a part of this appeasement, atonement that God has offered his son to make. See in Hebrews 10 and verse 1 again, the uh, reminder from the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, the law, the, uh, the, the old law, the law of Moses, the, the things that were written in the Old Testament, they were, these were mere shadows of the good thing that's coming. The real thing is Jesus. The anticipation of the real thing is what happened with the mercy seat, with the sprinkling of, of uh, the bull blood of the bull, sprinkling of the, uh, the blood of the goat, because can we sacrifice animals and have our sins taken away? Really? No. But we can have a perfect sacrifice. Jesus offering himself on our behalf. Again, he is, was like us, human, but not like us because he didn't sin. And so being perfect, he then offered himself as this sacrifice to pay the price for us. He was the appeasement we needed from God. Somebody had to die because that's what sin gets. That's what, that's what we deserve is sin. Jesus died for us. So we see in, in Hebrews chapter 9, <clears throat> again, that reminder, here's what happened. On the day of atonement, the, the, the priest going in and, and uh, offering the, the blood, that is Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is our high priest. Again, not a high priest, uh, not a, a, a Levite, not uh, under the old law. This is, of course, God's high priest for us from the tribe of Judah. A priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, not of Aaron. This is God's priest that he gave to us to make the sacrifice. And he didn't have to go in there every single year to do that. He did it once. It was perfect. He doesn't have to do it again. 
Jesus is uh, the goat. We see, uh, of course, John 1 and verse 29, when John uh, the Baptist uh, sees Jesus and pointed him to other people and said, look, this is the guy I was telling you about. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the guy that's going to sacrifice himself for us so that we can be atoned. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about when he was instituting the Lord's Supper. Setting up his own memorial day every first day of the week. And this is how we're going to celebrate. It's not hanging out on the lake. It's not cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. It's not uh, taking time off of work and, and you know sitting around and, and doing nothing. It, this is how I want you to memorialize this great event. Unleavened bread. The fruit of the vine. And he talked about, again, when he took the cup, he had given thanks, and he gave it to them. and said, drink it, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is why my blood was, again, not just sprinkled out seven times onto the mercy seat. His blood was poured out to the point that he wasn't, he wasn't alive anymore. His life was sacrificed for ours. And we see, of course, Paul reminding us in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And that last word, that reminder, it's because of his grace. He didn't have to come here. He didn't have to sacrifice himself. He didn't have to care anything about us. He could have created us and just said, just let loose you guys said, uh, you know, do whatever you want to. You're all going to, uh, you know, be lost forever. But, uh, you know, listen, that's your choice. He loved us enough to come and sacrifice himself and purchase us. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And again, that reminder, Hebrews 9 and verse 12, one time sacrifice. Again, the one more reason that Jesus is so much better than the law of Moses, so much better than, than angels, so much better than, uh, than, than everything that the Jews were, were going through. This day of atonement was one day. And now we don't have to worry about making sure we're around for the day of atonement next year. Because it's already been purchased. Our, our lives, our souls, our home in heaven. It has already been purchased because, well, he poured out his blood. Securing our eternal redemption. So again, that reminder of the mercy seat on the ark. Uh, we see in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, you know, when David was going to bring back the ark, <clears throat> and this description that he was given, and uh, he even talked about the fact that, uh, you know, how important the mercy seat was. And he described, again, the, the top there, the, 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 the seat, the, the lid, and then there with the, uh, with the cherubim. Said, which is uh, called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. He knew this is where God is. This is where he speaks to us. It's there on, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. We see uh, Numbers chapter 7. Moses heard the voice of God there. When Moses went into the tent of the meeting, again, here he is going into the tabernacle to speak with the Lord. He heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony from between the two cherubim, and they spoke to him. This is a really, really important place. And again, of course, then the, we have the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. This is where the blood was sprinkled so that God would, uh, would, would get rid of the sin of the people. They were atoned there at the mercy seat. It was a representation of God is here. 
And so the blood of Jesus was sprinkled on the throne of God for our atonement. And again, we've already said, not even really sprinkled. The blood of Jesus was poured onto the throne of God for our atonement. Peter reminds us that if we are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And so, of course, we know Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by God, was pleasing to God. Our atonement is completely paid for. What are we going to do about it? Sharp, you have seen numerous times. <clears throat> but what a great reminder. God has done everything needed for us to have salvation. He made the plan. He sent his son to sacrifice his life. He is our propitiation. It, we have been atoned. We have been redeemed. We've been purchased. But we have to take it. We have to accept this gift that he is offering us. Because his mercy, because his grace, because his love. Are we willing to do our part? Of course, learning who Jesus is and what he's done for us and being obedient to him to show our love for him. Confessing our faith in him as the son of God. Changing our life to match his will, being baptized to have our sins washed away, and then continuing to walk in the light as he is in the light, so that he will continue to cleanse us from our sin. We're going to sing a song to remind us of the fact that Jesus is our propitiation. It was a fact, again, that his blood was poured out, and it's our access to that blood that frees us from our sin. There is power in the blood Jesus. But it doesn't do us any good if we don't want anything to do with it. What is holding you back? If you are separated from God, why not come back today? We know what he's done for us. We know what he is doing for us now, preparing a place in heaven for us. We know what he wants to do. He wants to spend heaven in spend eternity in heaven with us forever or longer. He's left it up to us. There's power in the blood if we're willing to accept it. Let's do that today. If we can help in some way for you to be able to do that. Let us know as we stand the same. <clears throat> Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power.
there's a, so much uh, that we can gain from a good study of the words that God has revealed to us. And, uh, things for us to think about uh, and to continue our study about. Uh, Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. It's always a great blessing to be able to assemble with you here to worship God together in His way. I encourage you to take the things to heart that we've learned here and uh, even encourage those that there are several that we look around that are not here, so uh, I'll check on them, see if there's anything we can do to help. Those that have requested our prayers as well. And uh, may the Lord continue to bless you richly in His service. Isaiah said uh, for us, he said, uh, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Fear not, nor be afraid, for I have not told you from of old, and, excuse me, have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. There is, there, is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. The words of this song remind us that we have confidence, we know that our Redeemer lives and therefore is the perfect propitiation for us. After we sing uh, this song together, then Sid's going to lead us in our closing prayer. <coughs>